Coming up on Stu Does America, well, there was a debate last night, and it was not good at all. We'll talk about it with Blaze Media Editor-in-Chief Matthew Peterson. Also, I want to remind you, this is a good time to remind you, uh, we have the Anyone But Biden. Mm-hmm. Anyone But Biden 24 t-shirts, mugs. There's like a, a, one of those like uh, cold drink cups as well. There's stickers. There's all sorts of stuff at stewdoesmerch.com. Go there, get them. Stewdoesmerch.com. The code is stew10. Every time you watch one of those debates, it's hard to say it, but it's still pretty much true. Anyone but Biden in 24. We'll get to all of this in just about 60 seconds. But first, let me tell you about Bank on Yourself. Is say Wall Street tells you to put your money in an IRA or 401k. Uh, they say that risking your life savings in the Wall Street casino is a secure investment for the future. You could get lucky, could be great, but uh, studies show the average American who follows that advice will outlive their savings by 10 years, and those last 10 years are not so fun. Bank on Yourself is a guaranteed and predictable retirement plan alternative that gives you 100% control of your money, plus tax-free income in retirement. There's no luck, there's no skill, there's no guesswork required. Your plan doesn't go backward when the markets tumble. I mean, it's hard to even believe this is true, but it is. Both your principal and your growth are locked in. Bank on yourself is the strategy that famous businesses like McDonald's used when no banker would even come close to lending them a dime. And almost anyone can do it. This is built-in inflation protection and ultimate peace of mind for your retirement. Do you want a guaranteed, predictable, annual growth, control of your money, and tax-free retirement income? We'll go to bankonyourself.com slash stew. They'll send you a free report with a proven retirement plan alternative that banks and Wall Street, uh, they're really all hoping that you don't ever hear about it. So maybe you should hear about it. Bankonyourself.com slash stew. Get your free report right now. Bankonyourself.com slash stew. Yes, debate time. Debate number two. What a joy it was. I mean, honestly, to be perfectly honest with you, I am starting the show and doing most of the show today about the worst debate I've ever seen. I mean, it really was the worst one probably that I've ever watched. And it wasn't because I think it's the worst field I've ever seen. I mean, honestly, I was thinking about this a little bit today. Seems to me the 2016 field was probably stronger than this field. But still, there's some good candidates up there. They're saying some good things. This should be an informative event. And instead, we got people talking over each other constantly. And it was really hard to pick out any nuggets of interest. I will say, I didn't think it, the, the Fox business team did a great job. Some of them are good people. You know, I, I get that I'm not trying to bash everybody over there by any means. But they had a rough night. Everybody has them. You know, sometimes you go 0 for 3 with two strikeouts, and that's just the end of the day. Um, but let's go through some of it. We try to get rid of all the talking all over each other and try to give you some sorts of nuggets of information. What actually happened last night if you didn't happen to see it? Uh, and a lot of you didn't. Uh, frankly, there wasn't a ton of excitement for it, but there was some worth looking at. Let's start with uh, Chris Christie. He was asked about the government shutdown. The government will shut down if Congress does not reach a deal by the end of this week. Vice President Pence warns that politics of, quote, Trump's populist protégés, like Mr. Ramaswamy, are a road to ruin for the GOP. If the government shuts Kirstie, down, Kirstie's should eyes voters and blame eyes populist here. Republicans? Voters should blame everybody who's in Washington, D.C. Mm. They get sent down there to do the job, and they've been failing at doing the job for a very long time. And let's be honest about this with the voters. You know, during the Trump administration, they added $7 trillion, $7 trillion in national debt. And now the Biden administration has put another $5 trillion on and counting. They have failed, and they're in the spot they're in now because none of them are willing to tell the truth. None of them are willing to take on the difficult issues. They just want to keep kicking the can down the road. And the inflation that Nikki spoke about is absolutely right, and it's caused by government spending. And that's why people all across this country are suffering tonight. And yet we don't get any answers because Joe Biden hides in his basement 
and won't answer as to why he's raising the debt the way he's done. And Donald Trump he hides behind the walls of his golf clubs and won't show up here to answer questions like all the rest of us are up here to answer. He put $7 trillion on the debt. He should be in this room to answer those questions for the people you talk about who are Can suffering. And if the government job. and if the government closes and if the government Can closes, about that? it's the blame. Uh, it is to the blame of everyone in Washington, D.C., who has failed to do their job and just plays to the grandstand. Give him a job. Look, Chris Christie has zero chance to win this primary. We all know that he's one of the he's by far the most unliked candidate. Um, very few people are even considering voting for Chris Christie. But the overwhelming majority of that answer, it's hard to disagree with. Right. He is right that it's been everybody in Washington's fault. I think it's been more the Democrats than than conservatives. But Donald Trump uh, was the president when we added seven trillion dollars of debt. That's a big deal. We've talked about this a million times where the focus of Donald Trump and his campaign was never on spending. It just wasn't his top interest. So he never really pursued it. He never really tried to restrain it in any serious way. And in fact, protected and ran to the left of almost every candidate in 2016, protecting the programs that are creating most of that debt. And the fact that uh, he is not there to answer for that, I think, is a legitimate thing to criticize him on. You know, we talked about this a little bit last night when we were, you know, throwing back beers. He's supposed to be the guy who fights. That's why everyone likes him. And it's out of character for him to be sitting on the sidelines and letting everyone else go on TV and fight when he's not in the middle of it. And I think he should get in the middle of this. I hope he does eventually. Maybe he's just waiting for the field to shrink a little bit. Uh, Ron DeSantis had a, a, a kind of another attempt at this same type of approach, calling out Donald Trump for not coming. You haven't spoken, please. The people in Washington are shutting down the American dream with their reckless behavior. They borrowed, they printed, they spent, and now you're paying more for everything. They are the reason for that. They have shut down our national sovereignty by allowing our border to be wide open. So please spare me uh, the crocodile tears for these people. They need to change what's going on. And where's Joe Biden? He's completely missing in action from leadership. And you know who else is missing? in action? Donald Trump is missing in action. He should be on this stage tonight. He owes it to you to defend his record where they added $7.8 trillion to the debt. That set the stage for the inflation that we have. Now, I can tell you this, as governor of Florida, we cut taxes, we ran surpluses, we've paid down over 25% of our state debt, and I vetoed wasteful spending when it came to my desk. And as your president, when they send me a bloating spending bill that's going to cause your prices to go up, I'm going to take out this veto pen and I'm going to send it right back to them. Look, it's a really good answer. It's kind of funny because it's almost the same answer Chris Christie gave, um, with the exception of, of a couple details. The points are both true. The inflation is a big problem. It's one of the biggest problems we have. A lot of this, yes, has been caused by Biden, but it, a lot of it was also caused by Trump. And he should be there. I mean, look, he should be. He's, the, he's, leading, he's leading the field here. He should be there doing this. Hopefully he will uh, relatively soon. Now, of course, the border was a big part of this debate as well. It's, it's, I believe when you look at the issues as far as polling goes, the number one issue for people is the economy. The number two issue is the border. We've got a real crisis going on and uh, the solutions are hard to come by. We all know we can build the wall. We all know that's important. We all know controlling the border is important, at least on the conservative side in, this, in a debate field like this. Uh, but Vivek Ramaswamy was there as well. He was asked about this and talked about birthright citizenship. I favor ending birthright citizenship for the kids of illegal immigrants in this country. Now, the left will howl about the Constitution and the 14th Amendment. The difference between me and them is I've actually read the 14th Amendment. What it says is that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the laws and jurisdiction thereof are citizens. So nobody believes that the kid of a Mexican diplomat in this country enjoys birthright citizenship. Not a judge or legal scholar in this country will disagree with me on that. Well, if the kid of a Mexican diplomat doesn't enjoy birthright citizenship, then neither does the kid of an illegal migrant who broke the law to come here. And as the father of two sons, it is hard for me to look them in the eye and say, you have to follow the law when our own government 
government fails to follow its own laws. That's how we really go the distance and solve this problem and restore the rule of law in the United States of America, because that is part of what it even means to be an American. Now, look, you're going to have some legal scholars that are going to say, well, he's wrong on that. That's not the way they're going to read it in the Supreme Court. And that's fine. But like that's one thing that Vivek Ramaswamy has done really well, I think, in this campaign is to be bold. And that's a bold answer. He's he's I think he's giving a serious treatment, whether you agree with his analysis or not. He's obviously a good communicator and he's good in this format. I I, I think. He, it's interesting because everyone was sort of jumping on top of him and everyone decided that the big enemy was not even really Joe Biden, but was Vivek Ramaswamy last night. And honestly, it kind of crossed the Rubicon for me. I, I, I don't mind going back and forth with people, but it just seemed like they were being ridiculous towards Ramaswamy. They think he's uh, someone you're allowed to beat up. It's OK. And, uh, you know, look, it's OK. He held his own. I think they went back and forth in, in a pretty good way. Um, but I, I thought that was a good answer. And I thought he had several good answers in that one. Uh, now, DeSantis was hit. And there's a weird dynamic that went on. If you didn't watch this. Yes, there's a couple of Fox business people there. But there's also someone from Univision. And, and when I said with uh, Chris Christie, watch his eyes. He was focused like like laser beams trying to read her lips so he could make sure he didn't understand. He understood her because if he couldn't understand her, he would be called a racist immediately. So it was hilarious. Ron DeSantis had the same face like, holy crap, listen to these words. What are these words? Um, it was kind of amazing to watch. But DeSantis was asked about the whole controversy in Florida with education and that slaves had benefited uh, from slavery. It was a, we, you know, debunked this you know, months ago, but apparently uh, the question still arrived, uh, kind of still made its way, uh, if you will, uh, to DeSantis during the debate watch. You have said slaves develop skills in spite of slavery, not because of it. But many are still hurt. For the sentence of slaves, still this is personal. What is your message to them? So first of all, that's a hoax that was perpetrated by Kamala Harris. Uh, we are not going to be doing that. Second of all, up, that was written by descendants Run. of slaves. These are great black history scholars. So we need to stop playing these games. Here's the deal. Our country's education system is in decline because it's focused on indoctrination, denying parents' rights. Florida represents the revival of American education. We're ranked number one in the nation in education by U.S. News and World Report. My wife and I, we have a six, five, and three-year-old. This is personal to us. We didn't just talk about universal school choice. We enacted universal school choice. We didn't just talk about parents' bill of rights. We enacted the parents' bill of rights. We eliminated critical race theory, and we now have American civics and the Constitution in our schools in a really big way, just like President Reagan asked for in his farewell address back in 1989. Florida is showing how it's done. We're standing with parents, and our kids are benefiting. Now, Tim Scott kept trying to talk over him in that one. And, you know, he had a little bit of a back and forth when this controversy was going on. Uh, and he was then asked about the same thing after. And, and here's where Scott went. There is not there is not a redeeming quality in slavery. He and Kamala should have just taken the one sentence out. America has suffered because of slavery, but we've overcome that. We are the greatest nation on earth because we faced our demons in the mirror and made a decision. So often we think that all the issues, you talk about crime and education and healthcare, we always think that those issues go back to slavery. Here's the challenge though. Black families survived slavery. We survived poll taxes and literacy tests. We survived discrimination being woven into the laws of our country. What was hard to survive was Johnson's Great Society, where they decided to put money, where they decided to take the black father out of the household to get a check in the mail, and you can now measure that in unemployment, in crime, in devastation. If you want to restore hope, you've got to restore the family, restore capitalism, and put Americans back at work together as one American family. Our nation continues to go in the right direction. It's why I can say I have been discriminated against, but America is not a racist country. Never, ever doubt who we are. We are the greatest country on God's green earth. And frankly, the city on the hill needs a brand new leader. And I'm asking right. for your vote. I 
it was kind of a roller coaster ride there because I think, you know, he comes out with the, well, there's no redeeming part of slavery. And of course, no one was saying that. Everyone knows Ron DeSantis or no, any of the black history scholars were not saying there was a redeeming quality of slavery. Slavery. What was being said in that educational report was essentially what Tim Scott said, which is there have been hard times. Sometimes people have been discriminated against, but we've overcome that. You were able to make something out of this country, even when we had really bad times. And toward the end of that, you saw the Tim Scott that I think on paper people believed could really make a run here. Right. A person who's optimistic, a person who cares about the country, a person who says I've come through a lot of things and I've overcome them. And I've overcome them not because I'm amazing and a a miracle in and of myself, but because this country is amazing and a miracle in and of itself. That is the Tim Scott that I think could have made a dent in this race. We haven't seen him enough, and I don't think he's just, I don't think he's good enough at this. I don't think when it comes to uh, this field that there's really room for Tim Scott and Nikki Haley uh, on the same, uh, in the same field. It's just too jammed up with very similar opinions from the same state. Um, but I thought the second part of that answer was actually quite good uh, from Tim Scott. Let me see. Let me do one more clip here before we take a break and get to Matthew Peterson. Um, let's go to uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. He was talking about the transgender issue. And again, like one thing about him, and he's, he's not afraid to say things, and he's not afraid to be bold with his answers. Watch. Over 10.7 million students in over 18,000 public schools nationwide have the ability to change their identity without parental notification. Governor Christie told Stewart last week that he would pass a federal law to protect parental rights. Would you try to do the same? I have to be very clear about this. Transgenderism, especially in kids, is a mental health disorder. We have to acknowledge the truth of that for what it is. I met two young women early in this campaign. On parental rights in schools. Parents have the right to know. And you know what the hypocrisy of this is? Even New Hampshire failed to actually get past a piece of legislation here. The very people who say that this increases the risk of suicide are also the ones saying that parents don't have the right to know about that increased risk of suicide. And I'm sorry, it is not compassionate to affirm a kid's confusion. That is not compassion, that is cruelty. I met two young women, Chloe and Katie, early in this campaign, who are in their 20s, now regret getting double mastectomies and a hysterectomy. One of them will never have children. And the fact that we allowed that to happen in this country is barbaric. So mm-hmm. I will ban genital mutilation or chemical okay, castration know, under the age of 18. And parents in, in, have absolutely the right. Would you try right. to pass a federal law that says parents, parents should have that right? Right. We are going to require yes. states absolutely okay. have to follow that through. We stand follow for parental rights. Yes. And it's a good answer. I, I don't know if she was very focused on whether that was a federal bill or a state's uh, bill, but generally speaking, I think a really good answer from Vivek Ramaswamy. We have more clips coming up. We're going to talk to Matthew Peterson as well, but let me give you these polls real quick. Who won the debate? There's been a couple polls that have come out, and let me just highlight them here for you. Um, this is from the Washington Post. Who do you think performed best in the GOP primary debate? Number one, Ron DeSantis, 33%. Number two, Nikki Haley, 18%. We don't, haven't played Haley yet. We're going to have some of her coming up. Ramaswamy at 15%. Chris Christie at six, Tim Scott at six, Mike Pence really, I mean, did not do well. We're not even going to cover him. He was, he did not do a good job there. And uh, Doug Bergamentum at 2%, but a 2% that's right on the heels of everyone else. And then also, who are you considering? What percentage of voters are considering any given candidate? This is important. Donald Trump, 63%. Ron DeSantis, 51% are considering him. Nikki Haley, 36. Ramaswamy, 27. Tim Scott, 26. Chris Christie, only 15. And then Doug Bergam at eight. The one thing I'll just point out of that poll, A lot of people talking about uh, the fact that DeSantis can't close that gap. But the gap between Trump and DeSantis as far as who is being considered is pretty close. And if he can hold that uh, pretty close throughout this, if something happens, if Trump does something that people don't like, if uh, maybe the indictment stuff blows up or whatever it is, he is in the best position by far of the other candidates to get this nomination. Uh, We'll be back with Matthew Peterson here in a second. You know, if you go back to, I don't know, the 2016 debates, I don't remember one question about the pandemic, an upcoming pandemic. How will you prepare for that as a candidate? A lot of times the things that are really important don't even get discussed in these debates 
because we don't even know that they're around the corner. For example, supply chains. Well, there was no one talking about supply chains in 2016. We thought we were going to get everything we needed. And then COVID happens. Holy crap, look, look at what are we going to do? The same thing could happen here with our medication, and people are not talking about it. Uh, Jace Medical is trying to do something about it. They're not just talking about it. They're doing something about it with the Jace case. This is a great way to keep yourself prepared for the worst. They will prepare you with five different courses of antibiotics that you can use to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses. We all know that antibiotics will knock the basic stuff out. It's one of the wonders of modern existence. But if India and China are producing everything and we don't get any of it, that's a real problem. JaceMedical.com. Enter the code Stu at checkout. JaceMedical.com. Get the Jace case for you and your family. J-A-S-E Medical.com. It's the Jace case from Jace Medical. Candidates, it's now obvious that if you all stay in the race, former President Donald Trump wins the nomination. None of you have indicated that you're dropping out. So, which one of you on stage tonight should be voted off the island? <laughs> Please use your marker to write your choice on the notepad in front of you. 15 <laughs> seconds starting now. Of the people on the stage, Are you who serious? should be voted? I'm I'll absolutely to do serious. That. With all due respect, wow. I mean, we're here. Like, oh, well, you yeah. know, we're happy to debate, but I think that that's disrespectful to my fellow competitors. Nobody wants, yeah. to, so. nobody wants to participate. Let's do some questions. Oh, what a night it was. Uh, I want to bring in uh, Matthew Peterson to the program. He's the Blaze Media's editor-in-chief. Uh, Matthew, thanks for some, uh, so, so much for coming on the program. You lasted through this whole thing. This was the end of the debate. Yeah. Uh, who should be voted off the island was the question. <laughs> I mean, I, it was just a rough night for Fox Business and, oh. and everyone involved, oh. I think. Yeah, it was awful um, for everybody, exactly, especially the audience. <laughs> and I think what we just witnessed was the, one of the only bright spots. Uh, which is when Ron DeSantis reminded us that the media is the enemy of the people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if anyone should have been voted off the island, it was all of Fox News. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a totally inappropriate question. Now, and now mm. you know, to be fair, they do usually come up with some silly question at the end mm. of it. I've never seen that one done before. And it's an inappropriate question for a debate. I mean, for our purposes, I think it's totally okay mm -hmm. to ask that question. So who should be voted off the island? <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, I think because I think I could pull three off right now without even thinking about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It depends on who you want your representative to be of um, a kind of neoconservative, uh, more aggressive foreign policy. Right? right. I mean, because that seems to me the main differentiator between new and old. And it's very obvious that Vivek and Governor DeSantis are stand apart mm -hmm. as you know, I think moving the party forward in some way. Mm -hmm. And everyone else in some way, uh, you know, leans back, especially when it comes to foreign policy. So, you know, is Haley going to last uh, and stick around uh, longer than everyone else? Maybe so. Uh, she seems pretty strong, maybe the best proponent of that view. Um, but when you look at Pence and you look at uh, Christie, and I mean, Oof. it's... It, it starts with the candidates, right? I mean, we have a lot of candidates who just don't belong there. Yeah, I mean, look, Doug Burgum, I, it's, I now know who he is, and that's really all we can say, right? Like, that's congratulations to Doug. I think he did his job over the past couple yeah. of months. Thank you for your time. Yeah. You know, um, uh, I, I think if you look at uh, Nikki Haley and Tim Scott, mm -hmm. I think you're getting pretty similar packages there, mm -hmm. right? You're getting you're getting the more uh, hawkish sort of foreign policy, getting more of an establishment, um, maybe a traditional Republican Party candidate. Sure. And there's just no need for both of them, particularly since they're both from South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So, like, look, I, I, you know, I think you're right in that the energy of the party is in a more, uh, you want to pull back maybe from the uh, world stage a little mm -hmm. bit. But I don't think there's anything wrong with having a candidate who represents those mm -hmm. views. And in fact, in a debate like this, when you have probably 30 percent of the party who's still in that, uh, maybe, I don't know, I'm just making that number up. But mm -hmm. if you have that, you should have candidates up there and they should be arguing it out. And we yeah. should hear those conversations. But when you have two of them or th add in Pence, at least three of them, you can maybe add in Christie, though he comes from a slightly different group view. Yeah. It's just jumbled and nonsensical and we get nothing out of it. Yeah, no. I think you're absolutely right about that. And I think it's really important to have these debates. I think most of us do, right? I mean, we want to see these issues debated. They're important. Um, but the problem is when you have a bunch of them up there, like last night, 
all yelling about Ukraine. I mean, I was looking for the Raytheon executive in the back, you know, who was <laughs> whipping them on because everyone seemed to be like, oh, yes, we you know they're going over overboard to present a view that, you know, is 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 certainly on the right, but is not the majority view of most of most Republican voters. Mm-hmm. Um, so I see it as the interesting part, if there is an interesting part in the midst of this dreck, will be later on when the field winnows out. And we could actually possibly have something like an interesting debate. Uh, but, but that was not the case last night. It was a complete mess. Everyone was tripping over each other. Uh, you know, they lost control of, um, of the entire event, in my opinion. Fox yeah. did not do a good job controlling people. Uh, so it made it very chaotic uh, and, uh, you know, comical or either laugh or cry, I guess, <laughs> depending on your point of view. Let, let's talk about the sort of um, establishment media here and their mm-hmm. presence in this process. Because, yeah. you know, I, I look at it and, and I, I am not getting anything out of this. You yeah. know, I, I think the first one was OK as far as the debate went. I got something maybe out of that. Mm-hmm. This one was really bad. I, I, I think all the candidates made this decision that we need, or at least most of them, maybe not. I mean, Vivek and DeSantis, I think both came at it a little bit differently. But mm-hmm. everyone else was like, I'm, people aren't hearing from me enough. I need to start talking all the time. And so they were all talking all over each other. It was a complete mess. They couldn't get control of it. And the format itself seems dead. The, the place it was presented felt dead and old and, and, and just not yeah. where we are now. What should this process look like? Well, I mean, I think not to toot our own horn, yeah. but I think yeah. if you had something like a summit uh, mm. where, <laughs> where you actually spoke to each candidate right, at length and ask them interesting questions, Um, you know, you just get a lot more out of that. Uh, When you have a debate, uh, if you want anything that's substantive, you can't have, you know, a bunch of people on a stage. That's that's insane. Um, You know, if you go back thousands of years to (laughs) Socrates and Platonic dialogues, you Mm. can only have so many people talking in a scene, right? If you're writing a scene for a movie, it's the same way. Like, you can't do this. So, I think that um, you either have a lot less people and, you know, you go long. Um, you don't need to go full Douglas, maybe three hours long, Lincoln-Douglas debates. But, yeah. uh, but you, need, you need to cut down the people. So what you're looking at is basically people looking to make a commercial right out of that moment. It's classic televisual, uh, you know, good and bad. Take it for what it is. TV did this. Yeah. Um, but we're so used to it now. Uh, the dumbing down has now reached a point, I think, where people are revolting, revolted by it. Yeah. And that's certainly what I felt last night. I think that's what everyone felt watching it. This is not even a good time anymore. Yeah, it feels like, you know, when you think about, like, music, we go in these cycles, mm. right? Like, it's pop, and then it goes mm-hmm. into rock, and then it goes into rap for a while, and then it's back to pop. And it's like, there's these eras of music mm. where, where people go. go. And it felt, watching that last night, like, we've hit the end of this era. Yeah. Like, the, okay, yes. TV's yeah. new, we're doing these debates, everyone's on TV. And since then, we've had, like, yeah. for example, the long-form podcast, right? Mm-hmm. Where you're really getting to understand someone. The, the summit yes. that we did with, with Blaze Media, which I think went really well, and people mm-hmm. really appreciated that approach, I mean, it feels like this has got to change up. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think we're seeing this in a lot of cultural artifacts out there. Yeah. It's not just in debates. We're seeing kind of the end of something over and over again. And it's, it's as if the old way... They have lost the mandate of heaven. They don't have Mm. the ability to do the thing anymore. They don't convey the same feeling to you, right? Uh, And that goes for movies as well right now. I mean, there are certain things that Hollywood just can't capture anymore. They can't grasp it. And and this is is very much the same. So I see this as the end of the cable, you know, televisual era. And it's it's really done. I mean, I mean, and and you have to also say it's not just uh, the medium is the message. I mean, it's clear that the the format doesn't work anymore. It's kind of like appealing to no one and trying to appeal to everyone. Right. Right now, either you want you're into it and you want the long form podcast, you want to know more, uh, or you want something that's entertaining. This was neither. <laughs> it's so true. It was nothing. And I think, like, if you get down to, uh, whatever, if Trump and Biden, yeah. two guys sitting, standing on stage against mm-hmm. each other, maybe instead of one-minute answers, there are four-minute answers, mm-hmm. you might still get something out of that format. It's right. not impossible to grab it, But, like, seven people on stage, it's, yeah. it's, it, it really is absurd. So what, let's talk about the, uh, the RNC's role in this, because... Mm-hmm. It, there, it's no secret that if the RNC came to Blaze Media and mm-hmm. said, hey, will you guys put on an event and we can, mm-hmm. we'll talk the structure through together? 
We'd be interested in that. Absolutely. Uh, the Daily Wire, mm-hmm. I'm sure, would be interested. Mm-hmm. I bet you a bunch of places would be interested. Mm-hmm. New media outlets that are doing things differently. But what does the RNC, to, RNC do? They go to Fox, mm-hmm. and then they really mix it up with Fox Business Channel. <laughs> yes. I mean, this is the same formula. <laughs> and, uh, like, why wouldn't they try to take advantage of all these new outlets? <laughs> Uh, that's a mystery that <laughs> I would like answered. Um, mm-hmm. But I think it'll answer itself if the reaction to this debate, uh, you know, is what I think it is. Mm-hmm. And, and I think if 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 they fail at doing the thing, eventually there will have to be other alternatives. So mm-hmm. what I mean by that is, you know, no matter how entrenched the establishment is, or uh, you know how powerful something seems. If it can't perform its function, can't do the job, eventually something else will take its place. And of course, we are more than willing. We're right here. <laughs> you know where to find us. <laughs> yes. Um, but I, I, I do think that um, eventually you make a mockery of yourself, and people start laughing at you, and that's the point at which uh, <laughs> things will start to change. And that certainly happened last night. I mean. It was a mockery of the process, and everyone was laughing at it. So you can't continue to do this if you're the RNC, uh, or you'll eventually cease to exist. I mean, Fox has had a cozy relationship, right, with the Republican Party. That's great. That's fine. But here's the problem about last night. Last night, it's not only that the process or the medium, right, as we're talking Mm -hmm. about, doesn't make sense anymore. It's also that it was clear that they hate their audience, Because why else would you have people who radically disagree with your viewers asking questions like they did last night? It was insane. I I, I don't understand. I mean, it's it's just as bad as putting them on MSNBC and having, you know, Candy Crowley or whatever asking these questions. Mm -hmm. Um, When you look back at this, we obviously don't have Donald Trump there. And so Mm -hmm. there's a huge asterisk on all this stuff. We're not really seeing a full debate. Mm -hmm. I, I... understand why he's not there, mm-hmm. but I would like him to be there because, yeah. you know, without him there, it's, we're not really learning what we should. And, and I care about this movement. I care about this country. I, I, I want to make the best choice possible. Um, so when you look at this, who's the winner? Who's the loser? Is Trump the winner for not showing up to this? I mean, it seems strategically to be the right thing. Um, and then who did you think uh, who was actually on stage made a, made a difference last night? Um, first, the loser. I mean, the main loser was Fox News. Yeah. Um, I think Fox lost last night, and uh, and so did the old process, as as you just elucidated. Mm. Um, as far as winners go, you know, I'm going to say it. I, first, Donald Trump absolutely uh, did win by not showing up <laughs> uh, because he wasn't there for the train wreck, as uh, Glenn Beck and others have said. Right in the last 24 hours, I mean, he, Glenn is totally right. Uh, Trump wins. There was someone else that no one's talking about, uh, you know, and not, we're not talking about enough on the right, uh, on TV anyway, and that is Gavin Newsom. Mm. Gavin Newsom, I think, also won, and won bigly uh, last night by, really? sh- by showing up uh, as he did. So he showed up. If people didn't see this. Maybe they yeah. turned it off toward the end or maybe three minutes into the debate. <laughs> uh, what happened at the end of the debate with Gavin? By the way, if you didn't watch this <laughs> last night, God bless you. You're a good person. Uh, and the only reason I watched it was so that I could talk about it like this. Right. Otherwise, <laughs> yes. I would be a bad person for staying up and watching it. Uh, so, so what Newsom has done is uh, make friends with Hannity, right, enough so that they can have this debate. Uh, he can have a debate against uh, Governor DeSantis, right? And mm-hmm. those two are going to debate. Very interesting. Why is this going on? This is a very weird season. Everything's disintegrating. The old ways are disintegrating. New things are happening. So so here's Newsom, right, in California, in his element, at the Fox News debate, walk, waltzing around, talking to all kinds of people, right? He's been tweeting a lot about this. He's been, he's been talking a lot about politics lately mm-hmm. because he's going to help the president, uh, President Biden run. Mm-hmm. And he comes on the show after the candidates are, you know, get the debriefing with Hannity. And he argues with Hannity and spars a bit. And they basically prep for this uh, debate. And, mm-hmm. you know, I have to say, I know that if you're listening, your visceral reaction to seeing, you know, even this guy is, yes. I hate him, yes. he's terrible, no one would ever vote for him. It's almost like you're in my brain. Yes, <laughs> but, but, but here's the problem, and, I, and I, I want to emphasize this. If I'm wrong, here, this is the way, it's a Pascal's wager. If I'm wrong, mm-hmm. okay, great, great. you're yes. right. You know, a lot so, of you are right out there, Newsom sucks, he's mm-hmm. terrible, no one's going to vote for him. If I'm right, uh, you know, we need to pay attention 
because we can help maybe stave some bad things that could happen off. And yeah. he was in his element. He was comfortable. He was joking around. And it was if, if he was saying, I actually run one of the world's largest economy. You guys are a bunch of losers. He called them the JV XFL. Mm. Uh, it was hilarious. It's kind of correct, right, compared mm. to Trump because mm -hmm. Trump's so far ahead. And he was sitting there as if he was the boss and he was looking forward to debating De uh, uh, DeSantis. Mm -hmm. And he's made fun of DeSantis for even taking the bait. And so... And of course, Trump is not sitting back watching this going, you know, I want DeSantis to do a great job either, right? Right. So, so there's kind of a pincer movement. It's almost like a trap for DeSantis. But what's more interesting than anything here is, is Newsom's rise and his comfort and the ease he has behind the camera on Fox. Mm, that's going to be, yeah, because he's one of the only Democrats who will go on, right? I mean, he really yes. is. That's going to be fascinating. There's so much to think about when that, when does that happen? Do you know when the debate it's is? It's November 30th, I believe. Okay, so there's still a bunch of yeah. time. Okay, we're going to be watching uh, the lead up to that as well. Uh, Matthew Peterson, he's Blaze Media's uh, editor-in-chief, and uh, thank you so much for coming on, and, and thank you for taking the personal sacrifice of actually watching <laughs> not only the whole debate, but then Gavin Newsom after. I mean, you really sacrificed for the show. I well, appreciate it. Well, you did, too. You, <laughs> yeah, did, you, you did more than your part yesterday. But I yesterday. got drunk beforehand, so <laughs> that it was is a lot true. easier. I picked that week to give up drinking during the week at night. You're like, so <laughs> you're like I was the guy dry. from the airplane. Yeah, we <laughs> yeah. picked the wrong week to stop sniffing glue. Yes. Uh, Matthew, thanks so much, man. Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Have you ever bought or sold a home? Uh, most people, if, if you become an adult, you've probably at least considered doing this. And of course, if you're in a blue state, you can't afford it. But uh, if you happen to be in a blue state, maybe you had a house a long time ago and you watch those values go crazy. Uh, and then a lot of people just get the heck out of your neighborhood because COVID hit and everyone wanted to run away. No matter what you're doing, if you're moving across the country for work, if you're working across the country because you're trying to get away from an oppressive government, whatever it is, uh, go to realestateagentsitrust.com. Why? Well, on both sides of that transaction, you need the best real estate agent that you can have. And if you don't have that person on your side fighting for you, it's not going to go well. It's, it's, you're going to lose out on money. You're going to lose out. It's going to be a hassle. All those things don't have to happen. Realestateagentsitrust.com. The name kind of says it all. There'll be screened agents, the best performing agents in your area. Realestateagentsitrust.com. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. Well, what happens is when Joe Biden waved the green flag, it told everybody to come. And now we've seen six million people cross the border. We've had more fentanyl that have killed Americans in the Iraq, Vietnam, or Afghanistan wars combined. We need to make sure that we are a country of laws. The second we stop being a country of laws, we give up everything this country was founded on. So we have to secure the border. The way we do that is, first of all, defund sanctuary cities. You see what's happening in Philadelphia right now. It's got to stop. We need to make sure we put 25,000 more Border Patrol and ICE agents on the ground and let them do their job. I spent 400 miles down that border, and I'm telling you, Border Patrol agents aren't allowed to do their job. Let's go back to remain in Mexico policy. Instead of catch and release, let's go to catch and deport. What about, and the let's aid that we've been, what about the aid that federal taxpayers are paying to deal with the root causes? It's not working? The or only is it? aid that we should be spending right now is to secure the border, the southern border, the northern border, period. You would cut we off need to, to keep the Americans safe. And right now, Americans are not safe. Only when we fix the immigration system, only when we get the border secure, should we ever look at putting any more money into this. Right. Our money should be about keeping Americans safe. We're not doing that. Joe Biden's not doing that. And you mentioned Congress and, and shutting down government. I'll make it clear. We have to change the budget process right. in four years, in 40 years. Congress has only delivered a budget on time four times in 40 years. Right. If they don't keep the government open, they should not get paid. No pay, no budget. She, Nikki Haley there, um, she's better, I think, at answering these questions than she is at the sort of back and forth fighting stuff. I think she's trying to give off this, you know, girl boss sort of vibe that I don't think is successful. But I will say, I didn't think she was great in the first debate and it seemed to help her. So a lot of that has to do with just kind of coalescing uh, and, and coming, bringing everybody, I guess, together uh, in trying to take that group of people who will not go to Trump no matter what, which is believed to be about 30 percent, 
taking those people and they're starting to come together around Nikki Haley. Um, it, uh, again, I don't know if th that one's going to help her last night. I didn't particularly like her performance. And I am not a, a Haley hater. I know a lot of people really don't like her. I'm not that way. I think she's fine, but, I, you know, and, and, and probably would be a good president if she became president. But what I will say is I just don't I, I don't know if this approach works for her where she's calling Ramaswamy dumb and all this stuff. I'm not sure, but I just don't like it at all. Uh, let me give you a little bit uh, more from Ron DeSantis here in just a second. There's some real basics you need to have in life, some basics for your wardrobe, some basics for your home. Let me give you a few. Socks, belts, wallets. You got to have them. They're, they're an important part of your day to day. Grip six has got the best stuff. They've got a great selection of comfortable socks that are really nice and warm for the winter, um, but also not super thick. So your shoes will fit. Um, they have also got great wallets that will fit in your pockets and not bulge out of them. They have great belts that are sleek and minimalistic. So they're not jutting out of your shirt. All these things are made with American workers. You heard it on the debate last night. A lot of people talking about, oh, we're manufacturing back here. Well, Crip6 doing that, right? Some of these companies are actually doing it. We don't need the government to tell us to do it. We just need good companies to actually make good decisions. And Grip6.com slash Stu is a great place to go to get some of those products. Use the code Stu. You'll get 15% off right now. Grip, the number 6.com slash Stu. Grip6.com slash Stu. It's Grip6. How are you going to win over independent pro-choice voters in Arizona? Same way we did in Florida. We won the big greatest Republican victory in a governor's race in the history of the state, over 1.5 million votes. We were winning places like Miami-Dade County, Palm Beach, that nobody thought was possible uh, because we were leading with purpose and conviction. I reject this idea that pro-lifers are to blame for midterm defeats. I think there's other reasons for that. Uh, the former president, um, you know, he's missing in action tonight. He's had a lot to say about that. He should be here explaining his comments to try to say that pro-life protections are somehow a terrible thing. I want him to look into the eyes and tell people who've been fighting this fight for a long time. I was at, my wife and I uh, earlier today were at the gravesite of President Mrs. Reagan, and I noticed that um, there was a quote where it says, every single person has purpose and worth. We're better off when everybody counts. And I think we should stand for what we believe in. I think we should hold the Democrats accountable for their extremism, supporting abortion all the way up until the moment of birth. That is infanticide and that is wrong. I think it's a great answer, and I do think that that's another thing that uh, they can hit Trump on effectively. It's interesting because really the thing you thought maybe Ron DeSantis, Ron DeSantis would do most of this campaign, which was hitting Donald Trump on COVID and, and the related issues surrounding that, didn't really even come up last night in the debate. Um, but here's a, the abortion issue, which is another thing that uh, President Trump has been, uh, I don't know, I, I mean, in my view, wishy-washy on. Like, I mean, yeah, he has, I think, the greatest accomplishment of a president in quite a long time when it comes to the pro-life movement, naming justices, of, I mean, from a list of, from the Federalist Society that were able uh, to overturn Roe versus Wade. It's a great accomplishment. He deserves credit for it. And I guarantee you this, it will be the greatest thing he ever accomplishes, whether he has another term or not. That being said... He's also out there saying like, oh, we can't have we can five or six weeks. That's crazy. And, uh, you know, I don't know. Let's just talk to the Democrats and we'll come up with a number that everyone's happy with is the amount of weeks where we can kill kids. It's like, I, I don't know. That's just a, you know, it's not it's a bonkers thing. It's not the most important. Uh, if you look at polling, it's not the most important issue to Republican voters. But the people it is important to, it's incredibly important to. And I thought that answer from DeSantis nailed it. I hope I didn't miss you last night because after the debate, we went live on YouTube and we were doing this. Uh, we've done it uh, from both debates. We'll be doing it after all the primaries and caucuses and all the stuff throughout the election season. So why not go right now to YouTube.com slash Stu Does America. There, of course, you can comment on the show if only if you're a follower of the page. We need you to be a follower of the page. Make sure you click subscribe or follow or whatever the button says uh, and uh, sign up there. Click the bell, though, as well, because we'll get lot when we do go live for analysis and your questions. You can always join in. And don't forget, StuDoesMerch.com is where you can get the best shirts, including anyone but Biden in 24. The whole line of merch is up there. Use the code Stu10. You'll save 10%. StuDoesMerch.com. Go to Stu10.